This particular sequence is being shot in my bedroom in Haiku on the island of Maui in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I have lived extremely well here for 22 years. I was renting a room up the street here doing a yoga intensive for th a month with Sri K. Patabi Joyce, who later became my guru for about 12 years. And I uh, heard from my neighbor Jerry that there was a piece of land for sale here. He was buying one, and he said, there's another one next door for, for sale, five acres. So I came down, looked at it, and I bought it, because I love the street. Thank you. The Teenage Fair. Uh, I was directing, art directing a television show called The Michael Blodgett Show. And the producer, a small, very interesting man named Al Burton, uh, came out to my place in Venice and he took a look around and he said, you know, he said, I'm, I'm producing something called the Teenage Fair and I'd like to hire you to do a, some kind of an environment, some, something special, some art. And so the first year I did something, I forget what it was, I cut out all sorts of graphics and pasted them on plywood and cut them out and made an environment. Uh, I was making environmental graphics at the time uh, from, with a company in Minneapolis. And he liked the, what I did very much, and so he hired me again next year. The next year I did something like, I made something called uh, head boxes. I took uh, plywood and painted it black and made a bunch of big boxes and put lad ladders underneath them and cut a hole in the bottom. And people would come along and climb the ladder and put their head in this box, and each box had a different environment. One had a water fountain, it was under a strobe light, another one was lined with mirrors, something else or something else, I forget what. But each one was a different environment. So that turned out to be a pretty powerful, wonderful experience. Elfman, well, Rick and Marie were my two best friends in Maui, in, uh, in, in Venice. And uh, especially Marie, we had a lot of fun. We lunched together practically every day. And, We'd drive around in my Studebaker, or we'd go places, or we'd make art, or I'd help her with her projects. Or one year I went and visited her parents, uh, did that several years, but uh, got to know her parents, the Lalans. And uh, we, uh, we would do funny, goofy projects together, photo projects, art projects, fashion projects, and uh, throw parties, and we had a great time together. She was a very dear, still is a very dear friend. Well, interns or apprentices or assistants, um, I think, uh, Shank and you were probably one of my first interns at, back in uh, Venice uh, when you were about 17. That was great. I had, I've, I've had a string of, of helpers, of interns over the years. It's always been very interesting because I believe that four things are really important in my life. Mentors interns, muses, and partners. So mentors and muses. I think it's very important to have a lot of good mentors and to be a mentor for people. And so my interns, I work with them and I have an absolutely fabulous experience because they bring to me much more than I give to them, I think. I'm learning all sorts of new stuff and new energy and I'm, I love the relationship month after month we have interns come here usually three to four months at a time some from the university of cincinnati sometimes they're architect students other times art students right now we have a fashion design student uh, i have people come from argentina i have people come from germany all over america and i give them room and board they work with me in my studio and basically we're working on art projects photo projects uh, uh, design projects, book projects, films, uh, video installations. But what I, ultimately what I always say is that I really teach them how to make their life a work of art. I teach them about fashion, I teach them about eating, about entertaining. I teach them about health. We swim in the morning, every morning in the ocean together. Uh, we have incredible parties, we have film night every Monday night. We've seen 180 films already now. Every Monday night we watch films and discuss them, which is the most important part of it. So I'm teaching them to have their life well-rounded, to be artistic and healthy. Our motto here is half.
H A L F. Health, art, love, love everybody unconditionally, and F for fun. So if it doesn't have those four things, count me out. <laughs> the first two men mentors I'll mention are my brother Don and Marcel Duchamp. So my brother Don, growing up, I had a chance to see, he was seven years older, I had a chance to see what a man uh, who was artistic, uh, fashionable, intelligent, creative, funny. I got a chance to see how he put his life together and what he, everything he looked at became artistic. Decorating the house for Christmas, it was always fantastic. He, he was always impeccably dressed. He was like a, a Fred Astaire, a Noel Coward kind of guy, you know, a suit, tie, the tweeds, the hats, the interesting cashmeres. He worked in a men's store when he was young, going to school. He was a usher for the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra. Uh, back in high school, he was a cheerleader, probably one of the first male cheerleaders. Uh, and he would read the encyclopedia before he'd go to bed at night. He was so smart. So I learned about a lot about life from my brother Don. Amazing. Uh, when I had a nervous breakdown in California back in the 70s, he was the first one out there to help me. Someone had given me six or eight brownies full of marijuana, and I flipped out for three months. So he came and he was there with me. He, that's the kind of person he was. He was a really great mentor. Uh, the other major mentor, a man I love dearly, Marcel Duchamp. I had an art gallery. I decided to do a show of found art. I heard that Duchamp was still alive. I'd assumed he was dead. Somehow I got his address in New York City. I put together a catalog. I put his photograph of the urinal, the fountain, as a front page. And I said, art show, found art, dedicated to Duchamp, dates and so forth. And I sent him a copy of this. I said, would you like to enter this show? Lo and behold, I get a letter back from him. Dear Mr. Sewell, I don't make art anymore, but I'd be happy to enter myself in your show. Now, here's a man who, revolutionary artist, who brought the world of ideas to art. And here's a man who's entering himself in my art show. I thought it was fabulous. So he said, we'll be in Minneapolis, such and such a date. I'll call you when I arrive. So he called me. I went down to the hotel, picked him up with his wife, Teeny, in my old Daimler, 1950 Daimler, four-door sedan, British car, two-tone brown and black, fabulous car, lined with horse hair. I mean, it was bizarre, surrealistic. And there's Duchamp, gets in the front seat with me, and I see this famous profile, it's so famous in the world of art. And we go to my gallery, and he spends the day with me in my gallery. And the highlight was when I showed him my erotic collages. I was making what I call 60-second rapid erotic collages at the time. And I had taken, I would take photographs, full-page pictures out of softcore girly magazines. And I'd cut out different parts with the razor blade and I'd stick other things behind. Like I'd cut the girl's panties out and I'd put a pair of red lips behind maybe or a smiling face with teeth or something. Well, he took one look at these collages and he said, these collages are the freshest things I've seen in years. He said, could I have one for myself? I said, certainly. He said, could I have one for my friend Max Ernst? I'd like to give it to him because they remind me of what he did as a young man. I said, absolutely. I said, Mr. Deshaun, would you sign my necktie? And so he signed my necktie. Well, that got me going, and it was enough encouragement for the rest of my life with that kind of stamp of approval from Marcel Duchamp. I just felt like I could do anything, and I felt confident. And I felt, because my own father, when he saw my collages, he said it felt like someone had stabbed him with a knife and turned it in his stomach. So I found encouragement elsewhere, outside my family, outside my, from my father. I found it like a new father. Well, after Duchamp, I got a job, actually it was before Duchamp, I got a job at Dayton's department store. 
Dayton's was the biggest department store in Minneapolis, 12 stories high, family-owned, fabulous store. And there was an opening in the display department for a display man for the third floor. And I got the job. I went to see Joe Wright. Now, Joe Wright was my boss. This man was like my brother Don in a way. Noel Coward, Duchamp, uh, Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire. The man was incredible. And uh, big glasses. One eye went one way, one eye went the other way. Shock of gray hair. His office was pure white, giant desk with a huge copy of the, of the, uh, in India, the, the Taj Mahal, made out of wire, white wire. And in it was a big black crow. This is his desk. The guy was great, a painter, an artist, and he, just being around him for the year and a half that I worked at Dayton's was absolutely amazing. He taught me style, fashion, color, design, worldview. He'd go to Europe, he'd bring back a whole village and we'd put it in the main floor of the store and have a e import fair. Uh, he'd bring in Eng English guys from New York, uh, Tommy Rollins and Gigi Rollins, and we'd do silk, backgrounds to all the windows at Christmas time. Uh, a fabulous imagination. Wonderful, wonderful man. I used to, it was a big treat when I'd go to the Oak Grill on the 12th floor and have lunch with the display men. And Joe would be the host at the table. He'd be the head of the table. and He'd allow me to come sometimes to have lunch with John Panko and, and, and Dick Overby and, and Jack Forrest. It was just great to sit there at the table with them, with an occasional guest from New York or Europe. So Joe was an important mentor. Then one day, I'm in my gallery. A man walks up the steps. Very nice looking man. Smooth skin, beautiful blue eyes, hair of comb back. By the name of Basil Langton, Basil was born, I think, in Seattle, but grew up in London. He used, to, he used to run the National Theater. He was an actor. He was an agent. He was an artist, a photographer. Married to Nancy Wickwire, who was an actress at the, Walker, at the uh, Guthrie Theater. Well, Basil started taking pictures of me. He was working for Life magazine at the time, South American Life. And we became friends. He loved what I was doing. I enjoyed him and his artwork, and we started a friendship that lasted 40 years. And we would send things to each other in the mail, mail art, mail correspondence. He'd send me effaçages, these fabulous collages that he would create and half erase and half draw back in. He'd send me poems, he'd send me uh, articles, he'd send me stories about the Maha, about, about the, uh, uh, Krishna Murti, or he'd send me stories about Alan Watts, or he'd send me stories about Lao Tzu, uh, Zen stories, Chinese stories. He opened my eyes to spirituality, to art, to design, to um, New York City. He lived in New York. Amazing. Wherever I'd go, I'd write to him. If I was down, I'd write to him. If I was up, I'd write to him. Well, I've uh, assembled our correspondence into a beautiful, thick book. It's just amazing. There's a copy of it in the uh, Getty uh, Museum at the uh, Institute there. Uh, Weston Neff put one in there. Weston Neff, who was charge, in charge, another mentor, uh, Weston Neff in charge of the, created the photo department, the Department of Photography at the Getty Museum, uh, said that this book that I made of my correspondence with Langton reminded him of, of early correspondence between Duchamp and Man Ray. So I thought that was a great compliment. One thing I'd like to explore, and that is my dark side. That is my criminal side. My uh, the felon within me. Whatever happened in the early days to me, I don't know. But I was really bad. 
and I did some really bad things that I'm very ashamed of. The only good side is it gives me compassion for young men today that misbehave. I know there's hope. One of the first things I can remember doing was stealing a flashlight in a big department store in Chicago. And on the way home, my mother discovered it. And she said, what did you do? I said, I stole a flashlight. She said, we better just roll down the window and throw it out. She said, you're going to be better off without that flashlight. So we did that. That was the first thing I ever remember stealing. And then I'd steal things out of her purse or my father's wallet. But the real crime came when I was a teenager. One of the things I did that was so incredibly stupid, I had a pellet pistol. Uh, I had just shot all the balls off the Christmas tree. Uh, big, beautiful balls, fuchsia balls, 24 of them. I just sat and shot them all off the Christmas tree one, one year. My dad spent two days just plastering the wall behind the tree. But I took that gun. I stole my father's car, his 51, uh, 41 Dodge. And I drove down to uh, Lagoon Avenue or one of the streets nearby. And I double parked and I went in and I did an armed robbery. I held up the man that ran the grocery store with this 22 caliber pellet pistol. I think I probably got less than $20. I ran out, got in the car, and there was another car coming my way, blocking the street, so I had to make my getaway backing up. Crazy how I would even think to do something like this, but I did it. Another time I robbed uh, the gas station, stole all the money out of the till. I would think nothing of shoplifting. I would think nothing of, of uh, one time robbing a, a, a drugstore that a friend of mine's father owned. He got a key for me and I broke the, I, I, broke, I went in and robbed the place, then broke the window, made it look like it was a, a random robbery and split the money with my friend. I stole $5,000 from the two guys that I worked for in a record store. I would spend money on clothes and taking my fiance out to expensive dinners. No sense of ethics whatsoever. I was finally caught stealing the money from my, my bosses at the record store. And my father had to pay $5,000 to these guys. And I had to take a job in a, in a flour mill loading boxcars to pay him back. But I look back at that weird, dark, unethical life of crime. And I don't know where it came from. I don't understand it. I don't know what motivated me, whether it was thrills, whether it was just, I don't know. That's, that's what I'd like to explore at some point in my life, just to figure that part out. Because it seems so foreign to me now. Well, I know Garrison Keillor sent money back to, to uh, Dayton's when he stole something from them. Um, now it's a different story even. Uh, the woman that I, I didn't mention, I snatched a purse from an old lady. Now that's got to be the lowest thing in the world. She's probably dead by now for sure. Uh, I don't know how to repay anybody, but individually. But I think working with kids, working with young people, trying to maintain an ethical life now and um, sharing my, my story perhaps might help somebody. Uh, in terms of atonement, I don't know if it's possible. Hold there for just a second. I'm, gonna, okay, I'm zooming in very, very tight right now. It's just like your head. It's all I'm looking at. All right. We're still recording. Um, Tom, you, you have always been an amazing inspiration to me in the world of health. So, um... Absolutely. Nothing else is more important than health. That's why I say half, H-A-L-F, health. I'm 72. Uh, I've done a few things to my body that I perhaps shouldn't have done. Um, I have a few weak spots, lower back, neck's a little stiff. Uh, I think that the most important thing that we can do in this life is to have good health. 
and that means discipline, eating properly, staying away from drugs and alcohol and smoking, um, exercising. My absolute favorite thing to do is swim in the ocean every morning. I wouldn't think of missing that. It's just so fabulous. Being reducing the, the, the effects of gravity, being in those wonderful negative ions, uh, being in the water, being in the ocean, being in the sky, the, the colors, f feeling so good when I get out. Um, help. It's just like, that's, that's it, the most important thing. Surround yourself with people that are healthy. Oh, I think God's within us. That's all. Simple as that. I think a, a, an overzealous belief in God is harmful. And I think that if you just, that's why I like the Buddhist approach or the Zen approach, to look at the God within us. I like to look at the God in everybody else, see the godly part of them, not judge anybody, don't make anybody wrong, just love them all unconditionally. And um, I think between Having that attitude and being healthy, it's, it's a pretty good start. Uh, returning to health, one thing that's helped me immensely was getting involved with the yoga community, where I'm involved with people every single day who are interested in their health. And if you do something bad, you'll see it in your practice the next day. You take a hot fudge Sunday, one night the next morning, your practice isn't going to be so hot. You get drunk and you get hung over the next morning, you're going to be a wreck in yoga class. So you see it, and you're with people who are continually sharing health tricks, secrets, tips. Kale, eat a lot of kale. Charge, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, and surrounding, I like to surround myself with people that are healthy. It's great. I don't really remember when I wasn't happy. I've had a couple of breakups with girls that were very unhappy, very sad, very depressive. And... Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do, how I was going to get out of it. So sad. Uh, but once I got through those, that was good for me because it gave me compassion to share, to, to have more compassion for other people going through similar things. But I, I, I think that, um, gosh, I, I, I think I've always been pretty happy. I mean, uh, I have a phenomenal wife that's just great. We laugh, we joke, we have a tea party in the bathtub every morning and we, we play with each other and we laugh and we, we, have, we share a great healthy life. Her, in, her in-laws live nearby on our property and that's fun. Um, I had fun even with my mother. We, we laughed and joked when she had Alzheimer's. Um, one of my one of my main focuses in the world of art is to make art out of junk, make art out of tragedy, make art out of unexpected things. And I did that with my mother. I made a seven-year documentary film and book dealing with her Alzheimer's. When I moved in with her, my brothers moved in with her, I brought her here to my wife part-time. And I made a film showing the upside of Alzheimer's, the fun that we had, decorating her like a Christmas tree one year with light bulbs, uh, playing ball with her, taking a bath with her, um, doing fun thing, putting a fez on her and a, giving her a cigarette she'd never smoked in her life. I mean, crazy stuff. So I made art out of tragedy. Uh, my largest art project today was the Enigma of the Mill, which was a 10-year a project with lots of interns, uh, making a multimedia video projection piece, a one-man show at the Maui Arts and Cultural Center in the Schaefer International Gallery. It was a piece making an art out of the worst junk in the world, a sugar mill that's polluting, that's ugly, that's dirty, that's loud. People drive by it, they don't know what the hell's going on in it. I think it's like a temple. I love it. I go in, the steam coming up, the light coming in from a rusty hole in the ceiling, like 
like a shaft of light into a cathedral. The, I hear music when I walk through the place. The sparks flying from the welder in the corner with his little outfit on. And is it, it's beautiful patinas, the colors, the shapes, the design, the, 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 the molasses, the, the big wheels of molasses, 12, 14 feet high, molasses and the light coming through from a hole in the back of the wall shining on this molasses. The trucks with wheels is taller than I am. The men working with big machinery, pounding. Machines grinding the cane, the trucks bringing it in, the cane from the air. The fields, art, pure, simple art. The art of industry, it's beautiful. It makes me cry almost when I see it, when I think of it. I spent 10 years documenting this, making art out of junk. And my piece was 40 minutes long. It was like an opera. I put music to it. I projected it with six video projectors, seven computers, four assistants. And we did a one-month show at the, at the Schaefer International Gallery. 7,000 people came to see it. Even the men at the mill came with their families so proud. And the mill workers, some of them said, one of the bosses says, I'll never look at my job again in the same way. I showed him how artistic it was there. That was great fun for me, making art where there was no art, making art out of junk, making art out of found objects. Now I make sculpture using the same kind of junk from the mill. Tomorrow morning I'll be working with my welder, making giant pieces with all these pieces of Corten steel welded together and lifted up and light coming through them. Some of them have a little paint still on them, others are covered with rust. Some of them are 10 tons, and I, I, feel, I feel energized when I'm out there working with the welder making art out of junk. Ah, oh, my current love. I've fallen in love with this eight-year-old child. It's just wonderful. Michelle's little niece. I, I, I've never, ever, ever experienced this level of love for a child that I have with Audrey. Almost makes me cry. I'll try to get through this. So uh, Audrey uh, has some eye problems and she's got a uh, nice stagma. She's got macular degeneration, optic degeneration. She's got albinism in both eyes. She's got a lot of problems. But I don't focus on the problems. We don't think about the future. We, the doctors don't have a lot. They don't even know what the hell's going on with her. But we adore this child. And last year, we decided to take her to Europe and show her Europe. Well, she still got good eyesight. And we took, her to, we took her to museums. We took her to cathedrals. We took her to the top of the Eiffel Tower. She went to the top of the Eiffel Tower. I only went to the second stage. She never lets me forget that. We took her to my house in France in the Loire Valley. I showed her fields of sunflowers, 20, 30 acres of sunflowers, sunflowers as big as her head. She wanted a sunflower. I said, Audrey, why don't you do a drawing of a sunflower? We'll bring it to the farmer and see if he'll trade you a sunflower for the, for the drawing. And so she did. We brought the sunflower over. I explained to the farmer what her story was. And tears in his eyes, he cuts a big sunflower the size of her face and gives it to her. And she gives, she gives him the drawing. It was, it was so beautiful. We take her to Leonardo da Vinci's house near our place in, in, uh, the, in the Loire Valley. She sees all of his inventions that IBM has created out of wood, beautiful models of his inventions, uh, the, you know, the, the helicopter, the pump, the, the tank, the water siphons, the, all the things that he invented. And she looks at each one of them and just takes them in. You can see in my film about her, you can see her looking at these things, really understanding them going around his home, looking at his kitchen. She's amused to find out that he was a vegetarian. She looks at his bed and it just, it was so fun to take her places, take her to Paris, take her to, to my favorite restaurant, La Coupole, and have a dinner there and uh, gave her my camera and let her walk around and film the waiters and the other people in the, in the restaurant. So Audrey is, is extraordinary and I, it, it, it teaches me how to look at the world differently. She's looking at the world really fresh, and she's looking. She's really looking, and she reads, and she thinks. Uh, it's just been wonderful knowing her. Uh, last year, we took her 
uh, to Europe, but this year we took her to Washington, D.C. and New York City. And uh, every place we go, we just have a profound, exciting, wonderful experience. We try to stay at the best hotels in the city and usually make a deal with the hotel, tell them what we're doing and, you know, make photographs there. And they all get in, enrolled and involved in the project and appreciate it. The doorman lover, the bellhops, the waiters, the, the concierge, everybody just loves little Audrey. We went to the Plaza Hotel in, in, in New York City and had, had Eloise tea at the Plaza, which was fun. Went to the uh, Waldorf Astoria, they gave us a suite for a week and we stayed there and, and met all sorts of interesting people. And uh, Audrey went up and down the hallways in the, in the bellhops cart. And they took us, they, oh, it's just a profound experience. And it's been fun for me to document every aspect of it. Sure, photography, I started when I was 20. Bruce McGrew, my good friend uh, in Wichita, Kansas, at the Bottega Gallery gave me a camera and I photographed in a junkyard uh, details. And those were my first pictures. And um, I, got, I got hooked. And so uh, I've been photographing ever since, documenting things, uh, documenting unusual people, beautiful women, uh, muses, old men, uh, mates, partners, girlfriends, whatever. It just felt right to document and to, to photograph. Uh, later on, uh, different people inspired me, like uh, working for a, a, a few weeks one summer for Guy Bourdin, the French art architect, the French uh, uh, photographer, fashion art photographer, huge influence on me. Uh, Helmut Newton, um, Man Ray, um, uh, Ralph Gibson, a lot of different photographers influenced me, and. Uh, David Hockney to a certain extent. And I just love working with the camera. I love uh, recording things, documenting things. Um, to this day, uh, one of the most recent things I did was a big panorama of our Snork and Fork Club. As we're getting ready to get in the water, I shot a panorama of our silhouettes. And uh, it was in Art Maui last year. It was a, a big uh, six foot long print that I made. Uh, I just love to document things and make art uh, out of, uh, I use digital now, but I also like the photo booth, which was a, uh, I have a photo booth, I've had it for 40, 45 years. Uh, I love black and white photography, I love documentary photography, photo booth photography, um, iPhone photography, iPad photography, um, you name it, I like it. One of my big joys now is to have an archive, the Sewell Archive, which is a, a room in my studio of a young intern in there right now, Elizabeth McGowan from the University of Cincinnati, who is, has started digitizing my slides, putting them on, di on digital. And it's great fun to work with this archive. Um, Ella Neff, Weston Neff's daughter, was one of my first interns to help organize the archive. Uh, great fun for me to relive now and to re-examine and to re-visit uh, uh, these early photographs and to organize them, to make books, to make films, to make slideshows, to make all these things with the material from the archive. It's been real interesting. Well, you see in my house how I've been influenced by architecture. This house is, uh, has a certain Japanese quality, built out of clear cedar from Canada uh, because Japanese temples were made out of cedar and I noticed that the temples they never treated the wood whenever people touch the wood it just absorbs the wonderful oils from their hands and some of these temples are 500 years old and they're still made out of cedar so uh, architecture is really important to me I love building things I love uh, creating things uh, all my life in Venice California I've been buying old buildings and renovating them, giving them new use, giving them new love, and creating spaces that are interesting and valuable out of spaces that were not valuable. I think that's the key to my real estate world, is, is making value where there was none. And part of that has to do with architecture. Uh, architects that have inspired me, uh, major, major inspiration is Frank Gehry, who I've known for you know probably 30 years, and have been following his work and documenting it uh, ever since I met him. Uh, extremely interesting man. 
artist, architect. Um, uh, Tom Main, uh, Zaha Hadid, um, uh, there's uh, Steve Ehrlich. I love st my favorite house in Venice is Steve Ehrlich's house. We stay there sometimes. Steve Ehrlich has created a house in the ghetto. It used to be the ghetto. In fact, it used to be my Fuller Brush route. Uh, palms and Shell. He bought a skinny lot and he made what I think is one of the most beautiful houses in all of Los Angeles. One whole wall opens up to reveal a giant tree. There's a lap pool next to his house. Corten steel, beautiful light, great courtyard. Absolutely magnificent place to live. Uh, Steve's a great architect. Ted Tanaka does some wonderful things. Um, uh, even a, a photographer that I know, uh, Philip Dixon, who I consider an architect also, built a studio in Venice that's unlike any piece of architecture I've ever seen. The, the Philip Dixon studio, which I've visited and photographed. So architecture, extremely important to me. Uh, serendipity brought me to Maui from Venice. I was very happy in Venice. I never thought I'd leave. I was very plugged in uh, artistically, uh, business-wise, uh, politically, socially. All my friends, it was wonderful. It was a life that was brilliant, genius. I really was happy there. But and I had a great studio. Uh, one day I was complaining about my bad back, and my friend Paul Bob, the light Bob from Bob and Bob, said, you should see Eric Small the yoga teacher. Now this man is elegant. Talk about elegant man. Elegant, handsome, healthy man. Five, six years older than I am probably. Started yoga in a wheelchair because he had MS, but he met Iyengar and he turned his life around. Now Eric is a yoga teacher. He had the Beverly Hills Yoga Center, yoga center, in a magnificent house. And I took a class from him one class, there was a woman named Helga Kohler who stood on her head against the wall on her hands. So I thought, God, if she could do that, I could do that. See, it seemed like I could never do something like that. But I did it. I had really a wonderful hit on yoga by being with Eric Small. And I said to myself, I want to do an intensive, because that's how I learn things. All my life, all the workshops and the est and the different trainings, actualizations, whatever, always were intensives. So I want to do an intensive yoga class for a month in a warm place where I can swim. So I'd ask everybody, where can I do this? Where can I do this? Six months went by. One day, friends of my girlfriend, Lisa Kaufman, friends of hers, came to stay with her. They, she didn't have room. I put them up. They rolled out a yoga mat in the morning and started doing the weirdest thing I ever saw in my life, Ashtanga Yoga. I said, what is that? They told me that they'd just been with Patabi Joyce in uh, Santa Barbara, White Lotus Foundation, and they did a one-week intensive with this wonderful 80-year-old man from India. I said, where is he now? They said, he's in uh, Maui. So they gave me a phone number. I called up. I said, can I get in the class? A guy named Ricky Hyman says, sure. I came to Maui, walked in the room. Fell in love with everybody. Fell in love with the yoga teacher. Fell in love with Nancy, the yoga teacher that lived here. Fell in love with Patabi Joyce. Fell in love with all the students. Fell in love with the, the town, the street that I rented a room on, East Kuyaha. Everything was so great. The smell, the ocean. I'd run up and down the street in the morning. Everything was just fabulous. My neighbor, my friend Jerry Welch says, I'm buying a piece of land on East Kuyaha. There's a piece next door if you're interested. I called the, uh, the developer and sure enough I bought the five acres. And I've been here ever since. It was the smartest, best, most fun thing I've ever done in my life. I joined the yoga community on Maui. And for 12 years I'd go to yoga six days a week. On the, on the moon days we wouldn't practice yoga so I'd go have a double latte. Yahoo! Well, I think one thing will be my archive will be really well organized. And there'll be some amazing things discovered in it. It's like King Tut's tomb. I'm going to bring out these things that have been hidden for a long time and make books and films and documentaries about them. 
uh, Oingo Boingo, Kipper Kids, uh, uh, Rick Elfman, Danny Elfman, uh, Frank Gehry, uh, Early Venice, uh, uh, the Bruno's uh, Retirement Party, I mean, all these things that are in the archive. I think down the road, these are going to be more out there. Uh, two is I think that uh, my video projections are going to be amazing. I'm going to take all of these things, like the Enigma of the Mill, and really put it in museums around the world. Okay, that's it.